I'm uh, president here at the Palm Beach Zoo and Conservation Society, so it's uh, truly my pleasure on behalf of the 700 animals and 100 staff members living and working here, it's my pleasure to welcome you all to the 2015 Conservation Leadership Lecture Series presented by Bank of America. The purpose of this lecture series, it's really similar to our everyday engagement programs at the zoo. But literally a dozen times every day, our keepers pre present formal talks that always try to accomplish three simple things. We try to make some sort of emotional connection between you and wildlife at the zoo. Then we try to inform you of situations, if we can, out there in the field where many endangered species are really in trouble. And finally, we try to share a few things we can consider doing in our own daily lives that are always really pretty simple but often surprisingly helpful to wildlife like the kind of coffee you buy or maybe chocolate or even the shampoo that you use and if you think about it it really is how we all live at scale around the planet that so often puts pressure on wildlife if we are the fastest growing species and if we are the real apex predator at the top, able to outsmart everything else, then we get whatever habitat we want, right? The panther, the tiger, the jaguar, the shark, the other top dogs in their respective environments are simply, they're just no match for us. So the question is always how badly do we really want or need remaining wild places? Because in taking or altering them, you know, we may well be pushing the last of a species right off the cliff edge. Now, we certainly know inspired leadership really doesn't come from us dictating to people what they should be doing in their lives. Our ambition with this lecture series is rather to present, discuss some topics we think you might find important and to encourage your engagement. If we're pretty certain, for instance, that excessive emissions of carbon dioxide is not great for the environment or wildlife, how can we emit less carbon, but still have affordable and reliable electricity for simple things like air conditioning? Or if we know the big cats like panthers need more protected habitat to survive, how do we actually preserve habitat without closing the doors to other nice people like us who'd like to live here one day? And how about food production? How many of us will go home tonight, for instance, and, and have a meal with some portion of it grown in our own backyards? Does understanding a little bit more about soil and water and weather these sorts of things can all work together to, to produce more local food. Could this understanding lead to a greater appreciation for the environment and wildlife? So these are really all topics of wildlife conservation today. Energy, water and waste, emissions, food production, habitat protection, and all these topics offer opportunity for each of us to act in our own way on behalf of wildlife. So what better way to start the series this year than by hearing about that curious and lovable animal, the manatee, who's right here, right now, along our coast. And to introduce our speaker, it's now my privilege to present Tiger Keeper, Stacy Conweiser, who is still in her uniform from today's work in our brand new Tiger Habitat. She's one of our highest ranking keepers at the zoo. She herself has a bachelor's degree in biology from Mount Holyoke and a master's in conservation biology from the University of Queensland in Australia. Very accomplished young woman. Everyone, please welcome Stacy Conweiser. His efforts have resulted in coastal protected areas, 
in Florida, West Africa, Central America, and now Cuba. In the 1970s, Buddy worked for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service as a biologist and management specialist. In 1986, he moved to West Africa, where he studied manatees and forest elephants for the Wildlife Conservation Society and was pivotal in establishing several scope protected areas. Buddy and his wife Maureen moved to Belize in the 1990s, where they managed Glover's Reef Marine Research Station for WCS. They then returned to Florida, where Buddy oversaw marine mammal and turtle research programs for the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. In 2008, Buddy co-founded the Sea to Shore Alliance. This organization is a partnership of citizens and scientists with demonstrated capacity to improve the coastal environment and prevent loss of species and diversity. Buddy received his Bachelor of Science from the University of Florida, his Master's from the University of Washington, and his PhD from the University of Cambridge in England. He received the prestigious Pew Award in Marine Conservation in 2000 and has been featured in National Geographic documentaries such as Champions of the Wild and Wild Chronicles. Buddy has authored two books, numerous scientific publications, and popular articles. On behalf of Bank of America, it's our pleasure to now welcome Dr. Buddy Powell. Thank you, Andrew. I appreciate uh, the opportunity to come here and talk to you tonight. And uh, I, I'm actually coming back here after working here in the mid-1970s, um, just across the, um, actually this way, uh, where we were doing photo identification of manatees at the Florida Power and Light plant over in Riviera. And this was, the, this was in the very beginning days of manatee research. And actually, some of those manatees that we photo documented back in the 1970s are still coming here today. And uh, it's, it's, it's a great privilege for me to be able to continue to be working in this area and come full circle around again. Um, so tonight, I'm going to give you, there's going to be a little bit of, it's going to be a mixture. It's going to be a little bit of a travel log. It's going to be a little biography. It's going to be a little bit of a, of a history about manatees, there's going to be some science and hopefully some mission as well um, thrown in there. I basically have been able to follow my passion since I was a kid. Um, it's rare, I think, with a lot of people to be able to do that, but I actually got a very early start in the 1960s. I was a kid growing up in this small town of Crystal River. Um, how many of you have been to Crystal River? I'm from Crystal River. <laughs> No kidding. Uh, I think I graduated before you did. <laughs> so when I grew up in Crystal River, at that time there was one um, a scuba um, place there, one one dive shop, and I I used to take my grandma out in a rowboat fishing. Had no outboard motor on it, and she was this southern matronly lady. She'd fish with a cane pole. And when she passed away, she left some money to my parents. You gotta give these kids an outboard motor. So they bought me a boat. And so I was out on the bay, and there was this guy, and um, he was standing up in this aluminum John boat with a Sears and Roebuck little four, four horsepower motor. And uh, yeah, we kept looking around with binoculars. He didn't have a fishing pole, and he didn't have a beer can, so he obviously didn't. Okay. He, he shouldn't have been there. So, <laughs> I've seen him out there quite a bit of time. I, I finally got enough courage to talk to him. And as it turns out, he was a PhD student um, from Cornell University. His name was Daniel Hartman. And he was the first to really study manatees in the wild. And so when I went up and talked to him, uh, I, was very, I didn't know anything about him, but he told me what, I, what he was doing. And I was obviously, you know, like a lot of young people, very interested in the environment and so forth. And, it really intrigued me, and, but what he was intrigued by was my boat, because it took him about three hours to get down the river with his four horsepower engine. It took me about 20 minutes, and so he said, "I got to, I need to get to know this guy." Besides, my dad paid for all the gas, and so at about 15, 14 or 15 years old, um, I became his field assistant, aka sidekick, 
And um, we, for two years, I was out there every weekend, I just became absolutely enthralled with manatees. And at that time, there, there was only about 50 um, in Crystal River. And no one even really knew they were there. In fact, he came down to Florida to, he was trying to decide whether he was going to work on manatees or feral pigs. And he just happened to go <laughs> to this dive shop. And on the wall were these grainy photographs of manatees. Um, and the guy who ran the dive shop said, yeah, every once in a while we see one out there. And so based on those photographs, he decided to come back to Crystal River. And uh, so like I said, I spent some time with him for a couple years and, and still stay in contact with him today. And he wrote an article for National Geographic. And from that article from National Geographic, the Custodes came to Crystal River. And they were there for a couple of years. I was their guide when I was 16 years old. Skipped my senior year of high school. They still get gays. Um, but I had my first year uh, with the Cousteaus. And this is a photograph of me when I was 16. And this young kid from Crystal River wanted to protect manatees and wanted Crystal River to become a sanctuary. And so I took this proposal to the county commission, commission at the time. And in all of their wisdom, they said, I think this will have a negative impact on our local economy to have Crystal River become a manatee sanctuary. Thanks, but no thanks. So those of you that have been to Crystal River, how many of those same people actually went to Crystal River to see manatees? Presumably most of them. Well, those of you that have been there in the winter, you'll know that the major source of their economy now in the winter is going to see manatees. I was right, they were wrong. So as years went on, and because of that Cousteau special and growing momentum, and based on a lot of research that um, continued, Crystal River is now a national wildlife refuge, and they have 100,000 plus people coming there to see these wonderful animals. So uh, people, like I said, in Crystal River, even though Crystal River is sort of a mecca for manatees and people going to see them, um, Way back when I was a kid, they didn't even really know they were there. And when Columbus first came to the New World, um, he thought he saw mermaids. And this is what the scribe wrote in the log book. He said, uh, and this is from Columbus's log when he came to the Dominican Republic in 1493. When the Admiral was going to the Rio del Oro, he said he saw three mermaids, which came up very high out of the sea but they were not as beautiful as they had been painted, although to some extent they were like the man in the face. <laughs> well, today, we know that it's two different species that he was talking about. Um, but you can see the you know, how easy it was to confuse the two. <laughs> but um, he actually had seen manatees before um, in West Africa. He had sailed down the coast of West Africa and again, he kind of got a little confused at the time. But he was actually seeing manatees in West Africa. It wasn't his first time. The name for manatees in this larger group, which I'll talk about a little bit later, is Cyrenia. And so even in the scientific literature, there's still this connection between uh, manatees and sirens and Cyrenia. And everywhere you go in the world, whether it's dugongs in Australia, or whether it's Africa, manatees in West Africa, there's this connection, this mythology that's associated. In, in Africa, they call it Mamiwata, which is this, this mythology, this, this entity that lives in the, in the water. And it's based on manatees. And I have lots of stories they, uh, they about days in Africa. So how many of you think the manatees are related to sea lions? Raise your hand. So far, so good. Uh, how about dolphin? How about uh, whales? One person. How about walrus? Well, we've got a few people out there. Once upon a time, people thought that manatees were a tropical walrus. They do kind of look like it. Well, in actuality, this is their uh, closest living, well, the animal that has a common ancestor uh, with elephants. They're part of this very odd group of, of animals called the paniculata. It's kind of this, this really bizarre group. And, that, and we know this from genetic information, not just by looking at it. Um, elephants, aardvarks, hyrax, see these two little teeth right here? Um, this relative of manatees, for example, called a dugong, which is found in the Indo-Pacific, they actually have tusks, the males do. 
And so genetically we know that they have this common ancestor, not that they're sort of directly related, but they sort of split out and they went in different directions. So when I was studying forest elephants in, Man in Africa, I said, oh, this is really cool, you're studying elephants in Africa. No, I'm studying terrestrial manatees. <laughs> so you can, you can actually kind of envision that this, this muzzle is like a really shortened trunk. It's very prehensile, they use it to grasp things. And they'll actually go along the bottom and they'll feed on vegetation and they'll move it into their mouth and they'll hold on to things like this guy's shirt. And this is a diver, you can see his arm like this. You see the fingernails on the flippers? Um, they have some other morphological characteristics that are also very similar. One of the characteristics in common with elephants, elephants have tooth replacement, so do manatees. They have this endless chain of, of teeth because they're feeding on vegetation the vegetation has a lot of sand in it. So it's like sandpaper, so it grinds their teeth down. We only have two sets, right? And then they fall out like mine. But they, uh, so they can continue to eat this very abrasive vegetation, and then they continually have this, this tooth replacement. So there are three species of manatees. There's the one, we have the West Indian manatee, which has two subspecies. We have the Florida manatee, which is found in the southeastern United States. That's the one obviously here. I'm going to swing over. And then we have the Antillean manatee, which is found along um, the coast of Central America, the north coast of South America. We have the Amazonian manatee found in the Amazon. And we have the West Africa manatee, which I went over to study and spent 10 years in Africa, uh, collected. People used to accuse me of keeping a checklist of tropical diseases. Um, and then the dugong, uh, or the, another close relative of manatees, which, which is found in the Indo-Pacific. There was another beast called the stellar sea cow. And the stellar sea cow lived in the Bering Sea. And it was discovered in the late 1700s. It was this very docile animal. Um, it kind of floated on the surface, it ate kelp, and it um, ate algae on the rocks, and it come very close to the shore. And they didn't really have any teeth, they had these, these, this palate, this hard bony palate that they'd use for grinding the kelp. And so, um, Bering was stranded on an island uh, with this naturalist Stellar, and there were uh, Stellar sea cows there, and it was actually probably a remnant population that they had been hunted back from um, native people living up in that area. And this animal lived in cold water and got to be about 30 feet long, which is probably about the width of this room. So a manatee, by comparison, is about that long. Um, so this was a pretty big animal. And just uh, seven, um, 27, 30 years after its first discovery, what would happen is sealers and Whalers would come across um, from um, Asia, Kamchatka Peninsula, to the New World along Alaska and, and for sealing and, and whaling. And they would stop on this island, it was like a meat market, because these things were so docile, they were very easy to kill. So they would kill them for their, um, for their food and oil. And so just 27 years after the discovery, they were extinct. And, um, and they once had been very widespread in that area of the Bering Sea, and, and it's really, really a shame, and hopefully our animals will follow along those same lines. Uh, this is the dugong. It kind of looks like a cross between uh, manatees and a dolphin. It has a, a flute tail of, of, like a dolphin. Oops, sorry. They're strictly marine, so this, this type of tail is very good for, for swimming in strong oceanic currents. Um, and they're also, um, herbivores, and you see this muzzle is very downward pointed. And the reason is because they feed almost exclusively or exclusively on vegetation on the bottom, where manatees tend to feed everything from the bottom all the way up to the surface, and so their mouth is sort of more uh, pointed. Um, but if you remember from the map, they're finally, uh, primarily found in the Indian Pacific Ocean. This is the Amazonian manatee. Um, it has black skin, uh, this white blaze, um, they have no fingernails, their skin is slicker. Um, it feels almost like if you were touching an in, a wet inner tube. And they um, don't really have time to talk about tonight, but they, they basically seem to be the original manatees. And the other manatees 
and we know this from genetics and so forth, spread out from there, um, from that central Amazonian basin. This is the um, African, West African manatee, West African manatee. Um, this is what I went over to study in the 1980s, and that would be me uh, back in the 1980s. I haven't aged much since then. And um, it was the first in-depth study of, of, man of the West African manatee. Absolutely nothing was really known about it before that. And uh, it's, it's quite similar to the one we have here. It's an estuarine animal. It lives, it can live in salt water, brackish water, and also go up rivers. Um, and, you know, I studied its habits. It seemed to change based on the dry season and the wet season, where here in Florida it's cold weather. And I'll talk about that more that sort of dominates the movements of uh, Florida manatees. In Africa it was the dry season and the wet season and access to food. I'll tell you a quick story. The first manatee that I tagged in um, Africa took me a long time because I didn't have anybody really helping me. And it took me about a year to be able to catch and tag the first manatee. And so I was very happy about that. Um, I lived on this little hut, I didn't show it here, this little hut on an island in the middle of a river on stilts. And it would flood during the rainy season and then dry out in the dry season. You have to remember, like, I'm in my early 20s, I forget yet. And so um, the first manatee I tagged, put a radio tag on it. We didn't have satellite tags back then. We had this receiver to receive the signal by a beep, 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 depending upon where it was going. We'd point the antenna in that direction. So it had this routine. It would stay right in that area of the river, and then it would go over to this other lagoon, and then it'd go up this other river, and about two weeks later, it'd make this circuit and come back again. So I was out there tracking it one late, late one night, and it seemed to be coming back to the camp. Uh, where I lived on that So I went back to the camp, and then from there, I went to the capital the next day. I had to get a visa or short on food, I can't remember now, um, or some tropical disease. And so I went into town for a few days and came back again, and I couldn't hear the signal anymore. It was gone. It was supposed to be there by now, just based on its habits. So I took my boat, and I took my assistant, who was from Mali, and we backtracked. And we got about halfway back, and there was a village there, and we pulled up to the beach, and I'm listening to the signal, and it's going beep, 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 beep. You know, and I could hear it barely. And I go, oh, good, it's over in that direction. And then as I took the antenna and turned, it was held in my hand, turned and put it back in the boat, it went beep, 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 beep. And I go, oh, beep, beep, beep. It's in the village. No, it can't be in the village. And so we get out of the boat, and we go, and I'm walking around through the town with my little receiver and, and thing, and, and it's like um, the Pied Piper, you know. Everyone's coming out of these huts, because they don't see a white guy very often <laughs> in this way far off place. And so more and more people are coming, and as I'm sort of wandering around between the huts and so forth, and the signal's getting stronger and stronger, there's a couple fishermen out there mending their nets, and uh, very casually we walk up while this whole crowd is behind us now. And I said, do you happen to know anything about a manatee? It's called a lamata in French. And no, I'm not, uh, nothing. Yeah. And um, so the signal is just blasting out of his hut. Can we go inside maybe look around a little bit? Sure, go inside. And as I go inside, I'm looking around, and I'm going, boy, it sure does smell good in here. I'm like, it smells like beef. Wow, that's, this is a fishing village. They have no cows here. That's not beef. And so I'm looking around, and I find a piece of the collar around the tail that they tagged it with, and it's cut in pieces. So we take that out, and we show it to the guy. I haven't know anything about this little rubber thing that seems very bizarre. No, how did that get there? My wife must have left it. Um, so I keep looking around, and finally, I can't, it's, the signal's so strong, I can't find it. And, and I go outside, and I'm looking around, and listening, and finally, sorry, at finally outside, I don't know what I did. Uh, it's quite good, I think. And um, I hear the signal, and, it, and it's coming from the ground. Um, and I'm going, what is going on here? So we get our machetes out and we dig down, dig down, and finally we find the transmitter. 
and it's encased in stainless steel, the transmitter itself, and it's like Dracula. They chopped it up, but they didn't, you know, kill it. They didn't chop up the transmitter. And by this time, there's this whole crowd around, and uh, and now we're going, and I'm curious, of course, in the dialect. Do you know anything about this? Nobody knows anything about this. Okay, and, but every as I'm doing this, everyone kind of goes, whoa. Uh, and so we go off, I go down to the boat, my assistant stays up there for a little while, and then he comes down, and then we take the boat, and I go back to my island, and back over to, because I was working with the National Park, we go to the National Park, explain what happened, and he says, okay, we'll go back out again tomorrow morning with a, you know, one of the officers from the park, and we'll find out what's going on. So we do get up really early, go back over there, and when we get there, the whole, it, you know, like twice the number of people in this room, they're all on the beach. And there's this one guy sat out, you know, place planted out in front of them, and it's that fisherman. And they go, he did it. <laughs> He's the guy. And uh, what I didn't know was that when I went down to the boat, my assistant had said, you no, know, they're very superstitious, superstitious. They believe very much in witchcraft. And he says, boy, oh boy, my boss is really bad, and you see how strong his magic is. He can find anything, anybody. I'm glad I don't live in your village, because he's coming back tomorrow. So when I got there, you know, they thought the whole village was going to be wiped off the face of the earth. And so they said, he's the guy. Well, as it turns out, he was a manatee hunter. And not only was he a manatee hunter, he was a very good manatee hunter. So to make a longer story shorter, he ended up working for me as my guide. And his son went on later to work for my protege, who was an Ivorian, um, as his guide. And that area actually went on to become a, a sanctuary, a Ramsar site, you know, particularly for, for man. So this is a very uncomfortable, not happy West African manatee in Senegal. Uh, what happens is that the river floods and they, it goes out um, in these wetland areas and during the wet season manatees will go and feed and then the, if it's dry the river drops very quickly and some of them get stranded. Now many of these once upon a time would become lunch but now they actually in Senegal will take these animals and put them back in, back in the river. So uh, this is your basic manatee. Uh, it's it's very well adapted for its aquatic life. It's fusiform, shaped like a torpedo. Um, they have their flippers that help them walk along the bottom. They use them to sort of move food into their mouth. Um, they travel at about four knots, three or four knots, but in bursts of speed they can travel up to, to ten knots. I've actually seen one almost practically breach out of the water before and really frightened. They have this round table, round tail, and if I was in one of my, I like to go talk to elementary kids, I, of course, how many animals have round tails? And, and there's three. There's beaver and platypus. And manatees are also another one. And this tail, is, it's very movable, and so they can, it helps them to be able to maneuver under logs in very close quarters. Um, their um, nostrils are covered by flaps that keep the water from going in when they submerge. Um, and they're, what we have discovered fairly recently is those of you that are in the front and can maybe see, you can authenticate what I'm about to say, is that the back of their, their back is covered with all these sparse hairs. And they're very equally distant from each other. And these hairs have nerve endings on them. And those of you that have a cat or a mouse, when they're walking, when they're exploring, what do they do? They use their whiskers, right? Um, and so, it, and those, it's the same type of hair that you find on mice and, and whiskers and other animals. It's a sensory organ. We just found this out fairly recently, that all those little hairs have nerve endings that allow them to detect um, very, very slight vibrations in the water. In fact, they've done some studies over at Moat Marine Lab where they've put a manatee in a wetsuit, except for one hair, one hole for one hair. And, and that one hair can detect vibrations on the far side of the tank they can discover. So they're very, very sensitive. And we think that they use this um, to be able to move around um, 
and sometimes very, very turbid water, very dark, uh, dark water. Their eyes, they don't have eyelids. They, their eyes kind of close like sphincters, kind of, you know, like a, uh, an iris on a, on a lens, on a camera lens. They have oil to keep, keep the, um, around their eyes, to send mucus. Um, they're herbivores, vegetarians. Um, they'll feed anything from seagrass on the bottom, this guy's helping someone mow the lawn, and they'll, they'll feed like on mangroves or anything sort of touching the water. However, um, in, in the late 1970s, I was doing the first survey of manatees in Jamaica. No one really we knew they were there, didn't know how many. And I just finished and I got a, um, information that on the north coast of Jamaica, there, was, there were reports of manatees eating fish. And I go, yeah, right. Um, but I was really, really intrigued, not because of manatees eating fish, but for another reason. And so this is Stump the Trump question. Why would anybody be interested in a marine mammal on the north coast of Jamaica eating fish? I uh, know it's beach, um, it's very nice beaches and so forth. Anybody have, biologists here should know, maybe, no? Okay. And how many of you have heard of the Caribbean monk seal? A few of you? Caribbean monk seal. We had in the Caribbean a seal, and it was called the Caribbean monk seal. And it was one, it was even here in Florida, um, right here on our beaches. And it was very, very plentiful, but it was hunted to extinction. Well, or so we thought. So I thought until the 1970s. And the last reported sightings of the Caribbean monk seals were off of Jamaica. And I go, oh my god, this is, it can't be a manatee, it's got to be this seal. So I went right up there with the fishermen, and then I got there, and I'm all excited. And I said, draw me a picture in the sand. And they go, oh, it's got this big round tail. And it looks like this. That's a manatee, that's not a seal. And so I was equal, I was almost equally excited that I had not discovered the Caribbean monk seal, but what I did discover was that in some places manatees eat fish. What they were doing is, is um, they, they have this very peculiar, very stiff hairs in their muzzle. This one's either laughing or sneezing or something. And so, and these hairs can go in and out of its muzzle. And what it was doing, these manatees would go along on the north coast and they'd go to this net where fishermen, I actually ended up seeing this myself, they'd go up and they'd chew on the fish that was in the net and then they'd strip the flesh off and they'd leave almost this caricature of a skeleton of the fish in the net and uh, with these really stiff hairs. And these stiff hairs are very good for bringing vegetation into its mouth. Um, so I didn't rediscover the Caribbean monk seal, but I did discover that manatees occasionally eat fish. And now one of my students, a woman who has gone on to continue work in Africa, has also, when I was there, fishermen reported manatees eating fish. She's actually discovered that 50% of their diet in some places in Africa are clams. That, um, in areas where there's not a lot of vegetation, they're actually going to eat clams. So manatees eat vegetation, but then there's other things that eat vegetation off of manatees. Um, and they have this whole ecosystem on their back, and I can actually tell whether they're in saltwater or freshwater depending upon what's growing on their back. In the saltwater, they've got barnacles and saltwater algae, and the freshwater, they've got blue-green algae. And there's a lot of things that sort of use manatees um, as a source of uh, food growing on them. Um, there are other things that will come and pick at little um, uh, flesh and stuff that they'll eat the dead skin. But there are also other things that will eat manatees. Um, people, that's one thing. But also uh, crocodiles, alligators, and sharks. Probably more way back in the day. But we have had records of manatees with large scar scars from being attacked by sharks. They have a very peculiar skin. The collagen in their skin is a matrix. Our skin, our collagen is, is more in lines. And so with this collagen in their skin, is like non-rip nylon. And so, if something tries to bite into them, it's very difficult to take a chunk or to rip it. We think that's an adaptation for pre from predation. But what it has also done is sort of um, help them when they get like here. Anybody have an idea where that scar came from? 
um, is when they're hit by boats, is that it keeps those wounds from opening up and being even worse and widening and, and getting worse. So that non-rip nylon sort of from their collagen is, is an adaptation for predators, but also helps them when they get hit by boats. Um, females come into estrus, uh, she, just like a dog, she's followed by a group of suitors, males, um, up to 20 or so for a couple of weeks. She gets a little tired of that. And so sometimes they'll actually beach themselves to get away from the males. And that's what this one is doing. That's the female. These are all her little friends. And, um, and actually it, it gets to the point where we've had mortality from overmating, how shall we say? Um, and it's actually has happened you know, more than one time. But, but generally the female comes in estrus. And the males will stay with her for a couple of weeks. She becomes receptive and will make with one or um, more of those fellows that are probably closest to her. The, the calf uh, gestation is about 18 months. Um, the calf will stay with the female from a year and a half to about two years. This calf is about two years old. It's nursing right now, like elephants. Their nipple is an axile of their flipper, so he's nursing, or she's nursing by grasping on um, the flipper. Um, I think she's kind of had it at this point, uh, which is about right. It's about two years, and now um, she'll leave and they'll, they'll split up. What happens, it depends on the timing. Calves can be born throughout the year. Um, they t it tends to peak in the springtime, but it can happen all through the year. And so if they come into these enclosed areas of springs, which I'll talk about in a second, she can't get away from them. And so they'll just stay together. And then as soon as spring come time comes, she goes, I'm out of here. And, and then they'll tend to wean at that, at that point. Around Florida, um, manatees are primarily a tropical animal. Um, if it gets below 68 degrees or so, um, they need to find a source of warm water. Um, as they're a tropical animal, unlike animals living up north and whales and, and seals and so forth, they're trying to dump heat rather than retain it, so they don't overheat. And so they're physio physiologically adapted for trying to get rid of excess heat. So that makes them particularly um, susceptible to cold temperatures. And when, back in the day, um, where they would go to stay warm, they were in springs. Springs, the water comes from the ground, um, it's ice insulated, and so it comes out of the ground at about 73 degrees. And so the temperature of the spring is 73 degrees, and the gulf temperature in the summer is higher than the water in the spring is colder. When the gulf temperature drops in the wintertime, the temperature of the spring is warmer. So they migrate to the warmest water, they're like a heat seeking missile, um, and they'll go to that warm water in these springs. Um, they'll also go into other, any sort of warm water, including artificial sources, like you have uh, across the way here at the Riviera Power Plant. Um, the power plant is putting out warm water, and manatees have used this as a sanctuary when temperatures drop. And you'll, as you'll see, you'll find quite a few animals there during the wintertime. So a lot of these plants, which are the ones in red, some and springs around Florida provide these warm water sanctuaries. This is a natural source. This is my hometown. This is Crystal River. This is your hometown. And this is called the Three Sisters. Um, and there's a little channel right here and it goes up to these two other springs. Um, and there's a spring out front. And all these manatees, this is how the water is kind of flowing out in this direction. And this is actually a sanctuary, this buoy line. So it's early in the morning, not many people are here. So they're spread out where they would normally go. And then as soon as some people arrive, most of these animals are going to move inside this ocean stamp sanctuary. And they're just going in there to stay warm. Now, when I grew up in Crystal River in the 60s and 70s, I never saw any manatees here. They weren't here. They went to the main spring um, in the main part of Crystal River. And but what has now changed is that due to extraction from the aquifer, there's less water coming out of those springs. And so they are trying to find sanctuary in some of these secondary spring sources. 
And what's happening is like the three sisters and some other places, they're inside canals. It's in, relatively enclosed. And so that warm water, what's left of it, is staying relatively, you know, it's like having, putting a heater in here or a heater out there. It's staying, it's able to keep them warm in a fairly enclosed area. So they've now gravitated towards these springs. This is in your neighborhood. Uh, this is the Riviera Power Plant. Um, there was close to 400 manatees in this area. Um, and what we do is we fly aerial surveys um, and we count these manatees. So when you hear this annual count, this is what's going on. In fact, Ford Power and Light, in the 70s, when I first started working on manatees, it was basically uh, two organizations that were the leaders in manatee conservation in Florida. It was the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, which is now another agency, USGS, and Florida Power and Light. Um, Florida Power and Light put out the first publications. There was a guy named Ross Wilcox uh, that would work with us very, very much. And it was really through uh, these pioneering efforts of Florida Power and Light and some of the agencies that really started a lot of this manatee research. In fact, this research that's going on now that has allowed us to be able to track manatee populations for since the 1970s was funded by and continues to be funded by Florida Power and Light. And so a lot of what we know about them today and these trends and so forth is a consequence of this partnership between um, corporations and agencies. And so they continue to fly. In fact, one was done yesterday, Jody, I think. Um, and so this is long-term information, long-term data that allows us to be able to track these trends. But anyway, there's about 500 manatees in here. When manatees get cold, they get like frostbite. And uh, what happens is when they get cold, uh, water shunts away from their extremities and their skin. And they get these like this white halo around the tail or um, necrotic tissue around their nostrils. And if it gets bad enough, they'll die. They'll either die acutely if we get really extreme cold weather like we did in 2010, or chronically their health will degenerate and they'll die. Particularly young individuals are susceptible to this. Um, and with that knowledge, again, Florida Power and Light has been you know, very um, front thinking here uh, because as most of you know, there was a recent change in Riviera. They've gone to a more cost-effective and efficient uh, power plant from, from oil to natural gas. And, but during that time, the plant shuts off. No warm water. We know, not here, but up north where plants have shut down, manatees either go try to find warm water someplace else, or they'll sit there and wait for God to turn on the tap. <laughs> and they will just wait there and wait there, and actually they have died waiting for warm water. That's, that hasn't happened down here. But one of the things with my Cedar Shore Alliance, we work at Florida Power and Light to actually monitor animals in this interim period when they were changing the plant with those that might become susceptible to cold and could be rescued. Now they've gone one step, actually several steps further, they've also installed water heaters, um, jacuzzis for manatees. That when the, when the water temperature drops below that threshold, this trigger temperature, those heaters actually come on, kick on in order to keep the animals warm. And so um, that's the plant. Bye -bye. This is the new plant, and these are actually animals that are using um, the, the, the warm water heaters um, at the power plant. And it, it is critical, not as much perhaps down here, but they've also been changing these plants up at Cape Canaveral where it does get quite chilly. And those, animals, those, the, those heaters have been very, very important for the survival of over 2,000 manatees um, that are found on the east coast of Florida. We have another project um, with Florida Power Light down at Port Everglades. Um, also monitoring the condition of animals um, in that discharge as temperatures change. There we're looking at we're radio tag individuals. We're, when the plant goes from that period when they're going from oil to gas and it shuts down but they've got the heaters there, what we're doing is we're trying to find out, well, can these guys find warm water someplace else? And so uh, we do the satellite tagging. Now we can track them by satellite. And so this is just a photograph showing a series of catching them at Port Everglades down in Fort Lauderdale and releasing them. But one of the things I want to show you, see these marks? These are crayons. We do photo identification of manatees. We mark them with crayons. So when we take the photograph, you can see scars on them. 
Anybody have an idea where most of these scars came from? Folks. And so this animal um, has been hit by one time, one time, another time, and we have them you know, hit 40 to 50 times uh, sometimes. So we, we collect all this information uh, when we're handling and including health assessments. So most of the animals who found in Fort Lauderdale warm water <coughs> nearby, but some of them have, have, we've made some new discoveries. For example, we have a male that we caught a couple of years ago. Um, this is Fort Everglades in Fort Lauderdale. Here we are at, at Riviera Beach. This guy, uh, after, when it warms up, and this is typical of most animals here in South Florida, they'll go up to Brevard County and feed up on seagrasses in this area. But this guy kept going. This red is actually an accumulation of all their satellite pits. And he went up to just about Jacksonville. And then his tag got hit by a boat and cut off. So we lost track of him. And we go, oh, that's, that's really too bad. But last winter, last winter, he showed up in Blue Springs, which is a spring on the St. John's River. Now, to get to Blue Springs, he had to travel all the way up the east coast of Florida to Jacksonville, and then all the way up the St. John's River to about there in Blue Springs. And he spent last winter there, and he has spent this winter. He's, he's there now, as a matter of fact. And that was something we have no clue that these animals do this. And it's really, really important because particularly if you're looking at the long time survival of these animals, can they find warm water? Well, here's at least one indication that these guys know a lot more than we think they do. I mean, they, they know a spring in the St. John's River, which is, that was probably what, 300, 200, 500 miles away. So they're, it's very important for these animals to have that type of knowledge. And what happens is, it's kind of like the elephant looking for in the drought, that last water hole. So if warm water disappears or there's a problem someplace, they know where to go to. And these are probably older animals that have this knowledge. And they're passing it on to their young. And so if animals are getting killed, these older ones, by boats and so forth, that knowledge, that tradition may be getting lost in the population. If we look at genetics, uh, manatees in, I'm sorry, manatees in Florida um, they're isolated. They're, they don't have a lot of genetic diversity, which means they probably came from very few animals. Through the rest of the Caribbean, they have more genetic diversity, means there's more mixing going on. This is Cuba. Cuba's a black hole. We know nothing about Cuba. So in the 1990s, uh, my organization, Sea Shore Alliance, we were invited to come down, or at least I was invited to come down by the Cubans to investigate manatees in Cuba, because we knew nothing about them. So I went down. And we started doing surveys along the coast. And um, I'll tell you a real quick story. Um, if, so we're doing surveys to find out where they're found, but we also need to know what killed them. Well, how do you train somebody to do that? You need to teach them to do necropsies, which is the same as an autopsy, to determine the cause of death. So what I did is a lot of, back then, it was a lot easier to bring a manatee to Cuba than it was to take Cubans to Florida. Um, so, I got the permits and everything, and I was given a, a little baby manatee that we knew what it causes death, um, along with a dolphin, and I took it to Cuba in a cooler, it was frozen, to use as a teaching tool to teach the Cubans how to determine the cause of death. So I got my manatee in my cooler, and I got this other little frozen dolphin that I was, we were going to teach them to do other things. I get to the Miami airport, and they go, you're overweight. <laughs> it's a manatee, what do you expect? They go, I can't take it. I go, I'll pay. It's all right. No, you can't take it. It's really too heavy. So, <clears throat> I, don't know, I try to figure out, okay, what am I going to do? I've got a whole bunch of people on the other side waiting for me. So I said, well, uh, can I separate them? And they go, yeah, but I didn't have another cooler. But there was this, this plastic wrap guy next to us. So, frozen manatee is really hard. So I take it over to the guy who does the plastic wrap, does the suitcases. And I go, can you wrap this for me, please? <laughs> he goes, yeah, sure, like, no problem. So he wraps this little manatee, makes a very nice handle for it. And, uh, and so I take it back, and we have the dolphin in the cooler, and my little handy wrapped manatee. And they go, okay, no problem. Next. And the bizarre thing about it is, no one said a word. <laughs> it's like this happens every day. <laughs> Maybe it does. But 
Anyway, so we did the study in the Bahamas. I, I'm sorry, in Cuba, including a tagging study um, in the Isle of Youth, which is located right here. And I have a student who's part of the University of Havana that we've been working with. She's been studying manatees. Um, she's been up here recently and will be probably the first PhD student at the University of Florida, Cuban, uh, in 50 years. So I was down there in Cuba, and uh, we get this, this uh, um, report of a manatee with a baby. So she goes out, because I can't go to this particular area, it's restricted. She takes some photographs, and she brings the photographs back, and I look at them and I go, I know that manatee. And she goes, I know you're crazy. <laughs> and sure enough, brought the photograph back to Florida, and we went into the computer program, and it was a manatee that I had photographed in 1979 in Crystal River. It was this female, and she had been going, staying in Crystal River until 2006, when she decided, I'm going on vacation, it's about time. And she took her baby to Cuba. And that was the first time that we knew anything about, you know, that there might be movements going on. And this, this is actually photographs. This, uh, this is in Crystal River at the top, the original photographs, and these were the photographs that were taken down from Cuba. Um, in Cuba, they're still, well, originally they were hunted in Florida in the 1800s. That's when they passed the law protecting them. They're also hunted in Cuba uh, for medicinal purposes, and they're hunted actually throughout the range. In fact, most of this, these are from Africa. Um, and, but in Florida, it was mainly because of, of water crack that they were, that they, hunting was replaced by water crack. I'm talking about a quarter of the manatees are killed by boats. Um, perinatal is just sort of a, a Know, characteristic coal about 10 percent 14 percent natural and uh, 26 percent undetermined the natural can include red tide and there's this unknown reason and pathogen in Brevard County that is is um, killing manatees we've had over you know 125 or 30 or maybe up to 150 now um, in Brevard County that have died and the system up there the ecological system is changing there's a shift going on when manatees hear a boat even if they're in shallow water they'll they're hardwired to go to deep water, even if that takes them in front of the boat. Um, and so we, you know, sort of common sense, slow boats down, uh, gives boats more time to um, see the manatees, <coughs> and manatees more of the time to react to the boats. Um, manatees obviously can read, some boaters cannot. Um, <laughs> And what kills manatees from the boat? Quite often these lacerations from the propeller, but more often than not, it's a combination or because of blunt trauma, where they're hit by the skeg, the lower unit of the boat, and it will break a rib or something, and that rib will puncture an organ or a lung. And that, that's really what kills most of them. This is sort of mortality trends up through 2011, and you can see that probably with this population increase, mortality, of course, is going to increase with it, and that, you know, what the good news is, is it looks like boat-related mortality has begun to plateau. And hopefully, you know, our tools in the toolbox have, have served their purpose, and we're not seeing as much watercraft-related mortality. That's the good news. The bad news has been replaced um, and by other types of uh, mortality from quote-unquote natural events. Cold temperatures, is that related to climate change? Um, and also, or extraction of warm water from some of these um, aquifers and they don't have enough warm water available to them. And also naturally occurring events like red tide and some known reasons to pathogens um, is killing more manatees. In 2013, we had over 800 manatees die. And that was the highest ever recorded. And most of that was caused by factors that are beyond our control, but might be related, like nutrients in the water related to red tide, changes in the system in Brevard County, extraction of water from, from the Florida aquifer, etc. Um, other um, things that can um, cause harm to manatees, you go, well, here's someone touching a baby manatee, here's a couple of people trying to ride them. Uh, manatee is under the moon's out. And what happens is, it doesn't seem like that big a deal, but what happens is that if it scares them and it forces the manatees, if they're in this warm water sanctuary, back into cold water, or back out into the river channel, where then they're more susceptible to being hit by boats. So even though directly you don't seem like you're hurting them, indirectly it can cause them quite a bit of harm. So we create these sanctuaries 
And that's the one, this is the same place I showed you earlier where there are hundreds of manatees in here, divers on the outside. So the manatees have a place to go when they're being harassed to stay warm. If they're injured or become um, ill, we'll actually go out and capture them and bring them into a capture boat, bring them into um, what's called critical care facilities. There's three of them. There's Miami Sea Aquarium, uh, SeaWorld, and Lowry Park Zoo. And they come in as you know, an emergency room, basically. Once they're nursed back and they're stabilized, they might be sent to other aquaria, like at Columbus Zoo, Cincinnati Zoo, um, Disney Living Seas, and they're stabilized in order to open up bed space, tank space, for these critical animals. Um, once they're released, my organization, Sea to Shore Alliance, we go out and monitor these animals by radio tagging them to make sure it's like the outpatient care. They go out for about a year, and we track them using these satellites to make sure that they're doing okay. After about a year, we'll take the tags off, and then they go hopefully happily, happily along their way. And people can actually track these animals um, on a website. So if you go on to see you know, Susie the Manatee at Miami Sea Aquarium, and then she's released, you can actually go on the site and follow them and see how they're doing, not only mapping, but we put in a biography and the biologists put in field notes, and so people can find out where they're going. Getting around a little closer to home, uh, there we're talking about you know watercraft-related mortality and so forth. Well, right here in our backyard, I'll just tell you that there, and probably most of you know, there's a proposal to deepen and widen the inlet and also the port of Palm Beach, and um, it just happens that uh, it goes all the way down to that sanctuary that has 500 some odd manatees. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service said essentially no impact. And I'm going, what? Are you kidding me? Um, if you look at the data, um, and a lot of this was funded through uh, the county here at Palm Beach uh, County where we were doing several years of aerial surveys, you'll see that there are times of the year where you've got 800 manatees just in your county. And so we're talking about 2,000 manatees, 2,500 on the East Coast, whereas almost half the population of manatees are here in your county. And they're talking about putting in a major port right next to one of the sanctuaries, uh, primary sanctuaries on the East Coast. Um, the other important thing here is it's, it's kind of, Lake Worth, right adjacent to the inlet, is kind of like a, you know, what do you call it, traffic round, or kind of thing. Uh, because what's happening is you got manatees funneling in here. During cold weather in, a, in the fall, manatees are coming down the coast, and these black arrows, and this shows the direction of movement, and the first cold front, they'd all be going this way. So they're coming down the coast along the beach, and what do they do? They come in through the inlet. You'll see that there's not really that many along the beach here. They come in the inlet, they come, they go visit the power plant, and then they head further south to other power plants down here. Or they come in past Hope Sound and they come down the intercoastal waterway to the power plant. So all these animals, what, 2,000 or so up here in Brevard County, further north, are all coming through here and they're funneling right here through this county and then heading further south during the wintertime. Then the opposite occurs um, when, the begin, when the weather begins to pick up. So it's a really, really important place for manatees, not only just in terms of the ones that are staying here, but also uh, it's, it's a traffic area, it's a junction um, uh, for manatees. And so I think you know what my feelings are about putting lots of big large ships with very large propellers here. Um, floor power and light, as I'm sure all of you know, um, again, being right there on the front line of things um, as well, recognizes the importance of manatees and also the importance of manatees in this particular area. And so they are proposing to put, to build a really beautiful um, manatee viewing area. There's a couple others um, around the state. This is going to rival anything that's out there. Um, it's going to be an education center. You'll be able to go, it's one. Besides Crystal River, this is really the only other place um, in the world where you can see manatees in crystal clear water. And so putting this education center right there adjacent to manatees in that clear water is going to be extremely important because in the Crystal River, to go see them, you got to go out in a boat, you got to go snorkel. Here, people, school kids from all over the place can just sit there and look at wild manatees, not manatees in captivity, right there. So it's going to be really, really important. And 
So it's going to be very important for not only people, because as we people learn about manatees, they become more involved, um, but also just protecting that um, warm water site um, for the animals. And so, you know, all of this is sort of coming together. There's, there's a proposal by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service now to downlist manatees from endangered um, to threatened or even taken off the list. I wrote an article um, a number of years ago in support of this, saying it's, it's probably about time. We've seen the trend increasing with manatees. Uh, Watercraft-related mortality seems to be stabilizing, but that was before 2010. Then 2010 hit, and we had 500, well, total, not all of them because of coal, but about 500 manatees died. And then in 2013, we had 800 manatees die. And then we had the ecological shift up in Brevard County because of algae and plankton blooms, the seagrass is dying. We had more and bigger um, red tide events. Things have changed. Um, the whole system is beginning to change. And we can't necessarily right now, or at least I don't feel comfortable predicting what's going to happen into the future. So I'm very concerned about any proposal, personally, um, to try and downlist them at this time. So, all of you in this room, um, you, you're ambassadors, and I'd like to think that you're somewhat of like kind. I often get hecklers in <laughs> some of these things. Wow. But when no one's heckled me tonight, it does make it more interesting sometimes. Um, and um, uh, the, the point is, you're ambassadors. And we can put articles in the newspaper, we can go out in the magazine. But it's really those of you that have this passion and this love, as I've had my entire life, who can go out there and help explain to people what the real situation, what's really going on. Keep to the true information rather than a lot of the politics and misinformation. And particularly the zoo. This is the role of this of the zoo. Of course, it's wonderful to wander around and look at all these exotic animals and so forth. But but doing this and seeing and getting people very engaged in looking at these wonderful creatures that are here at the zoo is an educational opportunity. And I gave a talk earlier today at lunch to the keepers, and I said, look, how many people every day you know, come up to you or you have an opportunity to interact with? I said, look, you got the zoo here, but you got 500 manatees endangered right here in your backyard. And this is an opportunity for you to, you know, to link it all together, particularly this education center goes in, in that you know, it, you don't necessarily have to go to a zoo, um, but to get that message out, particularly with young people, because a lot of people are very much against swimming with manatees in my hometown in Crystal River. Um, there are envir environmental groups that are just absolutely against it. I am of two minds, because I've lived through it all, from National Geographic, the Cousteaus, to now hordes of people up there. There are now too many people going out. But I'll tell you, I swear to you, that we wouldn't have as much um, empathy, sympathy, sympathy, and involvement and support for, for protecting these animals if we didn't have, give the opportunity for people to have this up close personal experience like they can to these animals in the zoo, but with wild animals out there, uh, like in Crystal River, like what's going to happen at this education center. And what's really unique about manatees is that you don't have to go to Africa to see these big gray things, these incredible animals. You don't have to travel anywhere. These megafauna that is remarkable, unique species is literally off your dock or a few minutes away in your boat or in your canal. And, you know, there's, it's really, really incredible and unusual that you have such a, such a wonderful, marvelous animal that is right here. And so now you see why I have spent, I won't tell you how old I am, but traveling all over the world doing what I do because I want them to be here. Um, for my children and grandchildren, and we have an opportunity uh, to be stewards. If we, if we can't do it with what we have available to us, nobody can. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I just have to say, you know, everyone here in this room, all of us at the zoo, buddy, thank you for the work that you're doing. Uh, to preserve this incredible species, and uh, perhaps there are some questions in the audience for Dr. Powell. Sure, in the back, you're going to have to speak up if you can.
So the question is, um, is it um, dangerous? Did you say dangerous? 